they were made by the Paracas culture. So the whole Nazca system, starting with the candelabro and going all the way to Nazca, they were made over the course of a thousand years. So the first 600 years, they were made by the Paracas people, and then the, uh, the Paracas were actually wiped out by the Nazca who invaded their territory, and the Nazca continued making them for 400 years until they totally destroyed their environment by cutting all of the trees down to make pottery. That's actually the truth of what happened to the Nazca. They defoliated their land, so they had to leave. Um, but I believe they exterminated the Paracas because in the archaeological record, red hair disappears as the Nazca grow and um, the elongated skulls disappear. So most academics think that the Nazca and Paracas became one society, but uh, I don't think so. Also with the Paracas artifacts, whenever there's a depiction of an animal or a human being, they're always smiling. And uh, they were a very spiritual people. We found zero artifacts that were used for warfare. Um, the Nazca, on the other hand, a lot of depictions on their pottery of severed heads with blood coming out. So you see, not, not, not an easy absorption of two different cultures like the academics would like you to think. So this is what a natural, this is the first one I ever saw. This is a mummified, elongated skull of a noble Paracas. Uh, dark red hair, which again is genetic. Um, again, some uh, academics will say, well, over, <clears throat> over time, black hair becomes red and then can become blonde. It's not true. I've asked hair experts, and they say black hair is always black. Red hair can go lighter, like somebody who has red hair now, if you spend a lot of time in the sun. I've never seen any native people whose black hair turns red, you know, who live in Nazca, wh which never gets any rainfall. So it is genetic. That's been proven by two different studies. And the hair is thinner than Native American by 30%. And the two experts, experts say, this is Caucasian hair. So that's Caucasian hair on the coast of Peru, 1,500 years before the Spanish ever arrived. And this is an elongated head, also Paracas nobility. Uh, but again, it's swept back kind of like what Akhenaten looked like. And the theory here is that this could very well be cranial deformation, but it's possible that there were two or three styles that were done to the babies, depending upon where you were in terms of nobility. So the high chiefs would have one look, the religious people would have another look, and maybe the, uh, the highest level of, of other royal aspects would have another, another look to be able to finally distinguish the chief from the high, high priest. And at the, this is the end of the Paracas people, about uh, 100 AD. So you can see it's obviously cranial deformation. It's simply flattening of the front and the back of the skull. Then there's that. So con contrast, this and that. Original Paracas here. Uh, probably what happened is over the course of time, they, they couldn't keep inbreeding because of genetic defects, so they had to start breeding with normal-looking people. And over the course of time, the normal DNA starts taking over, and then the skulls begin to get smaller and more roundish, and that's probably when they started doing the head binding, because they had to maintain or dis that distinguishing difference between the common people and the royal people. Uh, and that's also possibly why uh, the cr um, a lot of the surgery or skull surgery was done as well, is not from warfare, but from the fact that while they were experimenting with this, they were having problems uh, with too much fluid being, uh, building up, so they had, would have to release it. But this is what a, na a natural looking Paraca skull looks like. And there again, the difference between a normal skull and a Paracas. Also, when you look more, and again, this is getting more into the medical aspect rather than the archeological. This is what your skull looks like. You have a suture across this way and a suture going back that way. 
Every human, every homo sapiens sapiens has that. That is a paracas. This one is missing. And doctors cannot understand what's going on. They say, where is the suture? I don't know. You tell me. You're the doctor. <clears throat> but that is genetic. So the, these people were born without that suture line. Um, and some people have said, well, actually, it's probably calcium buildup over time that made it disappear. But when that does happen, and it does happen over the course of, of your life, it still leaves a ridge line. So you can see that there was a suture. There is no suture. And also, we have what are called foramen. And those are holes in your jaw here and different locations on your face where blood flow and nerve flow come out. Because this, this part of your face is pretty far away from your nervous system. And so nature has done that in order to be able that you can fully um, speak and fully uh, feed the uh, the surfaces of, of your face. So that's normal. But in the paracas, they're also in the back of the head. And again, the implication there is that because of the elongated skull, nature has created those two holes for blood flow. So that's another genetic aspect of the elongated skulls, not, in, not found in normal skulls. Also, this little bone underneath here which is where major mus uh, muscle attachment is, is more pronounced. Again, because of the size of the head and the fact that it wants to move, move backwards. Um, nature has done that. I'm not saying nature from Earth or nature from Arcturus, but nature in general has done that. And then the form and magnum. Uh, and this by itself, means that the Paracas were not Homo sapiens sapiens. This factor alone. That's the, the form and magnum, which is where your uh, spinal column enters your skull, is perfectly at the center balance point, which, of course, is what nature would have done. So that there's not much effort. You know, your, your head stays upright naturally without too much muscle work. <clears throat> but in the Paracas, the foramen magnum is one inch back. And you can't do that with, with head binding because you would kill the person in five minutes because you would have to wrap the neck and pull it backwards. So this, is, this one genetic characteristic alone is why the doctors who examined recently the Paracas skulls say, at minimum, these are Homo sapiens sapiens Paracas. They're a subspecies of human at the minimum. They could be much more exotic. We don't know yet. That's why it's an, I've been doing this for 10 years. I'll probably do it for 30 more. Because I, I want the answers. And nobody else wants to bother to look at them. So, And here's another example. Look how, again, on the right side, that's a normal human skull. See how big the foramen magnum is? Look how thin the Paracas ones are. So they had long, thin necks. We're moving into alien territory at this point, or at least what, what one would possibly presume. But that's what they've, they've said. The necks are much thinner, and they would have to be much longer. And they wouldn't walk the way we walk. They would have a different stride. And this is simply another example of that. So the next step we're trying to do is to get hold of, uh, if possible, some of the bones of the neck uh, for examination by physicians um, in the U.S. and probably Europe. To see, also to see how many of the vertebrae there are. Do they have the same number? Are they longer? Um, the, the real unfortunate thing is that almost all of, you know, people say, I see the skulls, but what about the bodies? Unfortunately, we usually find the skull, but not the bodies. Um, and the, in the museum, it's the same thing. There are no full skeletons on display. But they do have 400 royal paracas in a warehouse um, at the, Lima, the main Lima Museum. And as just a side thing, again, it's, you know, these people become more and more interesting as time goes on. 100% um, of native people, if you're 100% native, from Mexico all the way down to Patagonia, your blood type is O. 
and that's it. Some samples were done of the Paracas about 40 years ago. Uh, a, a paper was published, and less than a week after it was published, it was taken down and hidden away because it was too controversial. But what the uh, results of 12 Paracas samples, I believe, were they found blood type A, 28.6%, blood type B, 6.1%, the rarest blood type in the world, which is AB, 12.2%, and only 53% blood type O. So automatically, that tells you that these people had very complex ancestry from different parts of the world. They didn't evolve from native people on the coast of Peru. It's impossible. So this was the end of the Paracas. We found uh, the equivalent of a killing field where 50 people with cranial deformation uh, were basically thrown into a mass burial and all the bones are broken, all of the skulls show trauma. So this is probably the Nazca entering uh, the Paracas territory and wiping, trying to wipe them off the map, mainly because they wanted their land. Um, it's one thing to invade and imprison people, but it's a lot easier just to kill the royal family. But they didn't all die, thankfully. But this is what happened because the, the, this area started undergoing climate change about uh, 100 BC and where the Topara people live, who were the proto-Nazca, their land was very poor. Uh, this area only gets half an inch of rainfall a year. That's why dependence on underground water. And the Paracas were masters of agriculture. All the green you see in the background, that's been under cultivation for 3,000 plus years. And that's where we get our food today. Um, so they invaded in order to take over the vast thousands, if not millions, of acres of, uh, of very productive land. And then we have this guy. This is the astronaut. And the astronaut was made by the Paracas culture, not the Nazca, because he or she is 3D, you know, three-dimensional, whereas the Nazca are, uh, figures, it's just an outline. So even... Uh, even uh, archaeologists will admit that this is a Paracas creation, and this is at Nazca. So the Paracas culture were at least uh, expanded at least from Paracas Bay down to Nazca and into the highlands of Peru where that little museum was where the head is the size of the torso that I showed you. And these figures too, these, this, uh, if you've never seen them, these are what the Palpa figures look like. So you can see they're very anthropomorphic, some guy with spiky hair, somebody else maybe with antennae, and uh, there are 1,600 or more of these things. This is called the Paracas family, and right on top of that, it's, it's actually a flat mesa. Um, right on top of that, we flew quite low over it, and there literally was a left arrow sign that's from 2,000 years ago. So uh, these are very enigmatic people. I haven't figured them 100% uh, yet, but I'm, I'm working on it. They also built, uh, what most people don't know, they built the largest ceremonial city of adobe in the Americas at a site called Cahuachi, which is very tough to get to. That was later overtaken uh, by the Nazca people. Um, it's 12 kilometers of washboard to, to drive there. You, most people lose at least one filling. But it's, it's massive, and uh, they've only uncovered one. This is one of the pyramidal structures. The entire landscape you look, and you see these beautiful hills. They're all pyramids, but they haven't been excavated because uh, Italy was financing it, and Italy's basically gone bankrupt at this point. But uh, they're all, the good thing is they're all there and preserved, so there are at least 30 of these huge structures that have not seen the light of day for 1,500 to 2,000 years. And this is a trophy, what's called a trophy skull. So this is a Paracas skull that was found at Kahawachi, and it's something that the Nazca used for divination. Because after they wiped out the, the royal Paracas, <coughs> they took over the land, but it turns out they weren't very good at agriculture. So gradually they started to destroy their landscape. Like the mystery of the Nazca is not that they disappeared in spaceships. They literally destroyed their environment. 
So their last desperate attempt to survive was to use the Paracas skulls for divination to pray for rain. Uh, and this is a very unique artifact. It's, uh, it's made of cloth and feathers. Um, it's in Senior Juan's museum. It's the only kind, one of its kind uh, made out of textiles showing an elongated head. The National Museum of Peru wants it desperately, but uh, so far it's still in the little museum. Oh, and also what it shows, you see the bird feathers. Those are from birds from the Amazon. So the Paracas were trading as far as the Amazon 2,000 plus years ago, as well as up into Ecuador and the highlands of Peru, because we find lots of, of llama wool, and la llamas do not like living on the coast of Peru. So that's one thing people don't understand about ancient cultures. They think, oh, it's all just a bunch of little villages, and they just traded with each other. These people were trading hundreds of miles through chains of civilization in ancient Peru. And this is what, uh, you know, here we have a classic Paracas elongated skull with dark red hair. It's wavy hair, too. It's not typical Native American straight hair. It's wavy. It is more Caucasian than it is Native American. And this is a difference between a normal human baby, one year old on the left, and an 18-month-old Paracas baby on the right. We can tell that because we had a, a dental um, forensic dentist in Ica, Peru, come and examine, and he said 18 to 22 months based on the dentition. So that's quite a, you know, you're looking at quite a radical difference. And their god, we believe, was called Khan, and he had red hair, and that's where Kontiki comes from. So almost always Khan is shown with red hair or blonde hair, not with black hair and not with blue hair, just red, blonde. And there are numerous examples of this red hair um, that I've seen. Usually dark red, but sometimes medium red, but never like carrot top Irish red, never like that. But it's uh, auburn, and auburn hair, or yeah, auburn hair and red hair, the place of origin is the Middle East. It's not Ireland and Scotland and Scandinavia. It's an a very ancient bloodlines. So here again, dark red hair, blonde hair. Most archaeologists don't want you to see that, that this picture especially. Uh, Senior Juan said he did, at one time, he saw one that uh, was a, a truly conehead skull with almost surfer blonde hair. But I, I don't know what happened to it. I, it probably wound up on the, like everything on the black market. So in terms of distribution, this is the standard story of um, migration to the Americas. Uh, and especially when you get into South America, it's still commonly believed that all Native Americans, ancestors, crossed the Bering Land Bridge and that they were of haplogroups A, B, C, and D from Southeast Asia. And this is where the Paracas um, are different. This is the baby again, and her haplogroup, which is her genetic ancestry on her mother's side, is U2E1. And that's commonly found in Scandinavia and the Black Sea. Then this one is from the highlands of Peru. It's not a Paracas, but we tested it anyway because it was, it's actually located in Oregon. So it was easy to get it genetically tested because trying to get samples out of Peru requires the government, which is very time consuming. So this one turned out to be T2, which again is located in places like uh, Italy, parts of England, Scandinavia, um, and the Black Sea. And then this one is the mummified one. This is where you can definitely see the red hair. And its is H1. So H1, again, is located in Scandinavia and Russia, bordering on the Black Sea. And the one on the left, which was related to, to the baby on the right, that may have been 
the mother or an aunt, and that is H2A, located epicenter, the Caspian, and the Black Sea. So the problem I had was when we got the DNA results back, and again, we only got the uh, mitochondrial, none of the nuclear showed up. So it's because it's much more difficult to get nuclear DNA, especially when the person's 2,000 years old. So at the moment, we only have the, the mother's DNA and the father's none whatsoever. But uh, I saw all these different haplogroups, and you look them up on the maps, and it's like it's all over the place. But the commonality is the Black and Caspian Sea area. So these are the actual results. Um, these are the haplogroups that show up. U2E1, U2E, H1HK, H2A, T2B, J1B1, B, which is Native American, in one, two, three cases, I think, and then H. But most of, most of the DNA is not Native American. So now we look at the Black Sea. And the commonality, again, is all of these haplogroups are found in this area. This is just preliminary at the moment, but I'm also working with five researchers in Russia, and they're sending me photographs of uh, elongated skulls from that area that are almost exactly the same as the Paracas. So we're hinting here at migration from here to the coast of Peru. Uh, the question is why, and it's likely, again, that they were a small population of people, very intelligent, very peaceful, and were invaded uh, by others and were forced to flee. That's my theory so far, because that's what's going on. You know, this is the Eurasia, which is very close to um, the Middle East, and we know what's going on in the Middle East right now and what has been going on in the Middle East for more than 2,000 years nonstop. Uh, one thing that ISIS is, has been doing is um, they are not the indigenous people of the Middle East. They're indigenous to a part of the Middle East. But what ISIS has been doing is hunting down and killing, especially females who have red or blonde hair and blue eyes. They're the indigenous people. So this place, this whole area has, has just always been in conflict. And so I think that's the theory, is that they were forced to leave. And these are some examples that, um, of the skulls that are on display. One or two especially are these two. You see, the one on the right even has a suture coming down the forehead that's not supposed to be there. So that's another genetic anomaly. And here, a baby found in Crimea, two years old. The head is basically the size of the torso. So we're starting, this is very fresh information, so that's why I'm just saying that there are commonalities at this point. I'm not being f firm that there was a migration, but the Paracas had to have come from somewhere else. So this is my theory so far, is they, they went south and they entered the Red Sea and by the time they got into the larger ocean, <clears throat> they could have taken what's called the southwest monsoon current that would have naturally taken them into the Pacific. And of course, they would have stopped. This may have taken 10 years, 100 years. Uh, a lot of red ancient red hair shows up in Polynesia, too, like pre-Polynesian. There are even people to this day who live in parts of Polynesia who have dark red hair. And when you say, where does that come from? They say, oh, that's before the Polynesians came. Uh, on Easter Island, too. But when uh, Van Rogeveen, who was the discoverer of Easter Island and named it that, the Dutch explorer, in his uh, record, he said, uh, upon first contact on Easter Island, he said, I see dark-haired people, red-haired people, blonde-haired people, tall people and short people and medium-sized people. So again, the, you, what you've heard is nobody was on Easter Island and then the Polynesians show up a thousand years ago. But the Polynesians show up and somebody else is living there. The same thing in New Zealand and other places. They, also recently they found elongated skulls in Australia 
dated back to 12,000 years ago, and they were not Aboriginal. So this whole myth we've been taught about that uh, Columbus was the, the great voyager, you know, who found the new world, or that the Vikings were the great voyagers who found the new world. The Polynesians and other people have been sailing the Pacific for thousands upon thousands of years. Uh, so now we get into other anomalies. This is a drawing made in the 19th century of a seven-month-old fetus with the head the size of the body and teeth. I see